Welcome to the course, Introduction to Urban Planning. In this session today, we will continue with our efforts to contextualize our cities. In the previous class, we reviewed the emplotment and covered Mesopotamian, Egyptian and Indus Valley civilization and today we shall review Vedic period. Therefore, the coverage of this lecture will include Vedic period. We see that these civilization had huge influence on cities of today. Many innovations of that time we see even today in our cities. The period is said to stretch from 1750 to 350 BC. The geographical boundary of the earlier Vedic period started from northern part of Indian continent and later on it stretched to the entire South Asian continent. As we see in the left hand side image, Vedic period was the time when the languages and scripts evolved. The period is said to stretch from 1750 to 350 BC. The geographical boundary of the earlier Vedic period started from northern part of Indian continent and later on it stretched to the entire South Asian continent as we can see in the left hand side image. We also see that Vedic period was the time when the languages and scripts evolved. Looking at the origin of Vedic architecture and planning, Indian culture and civilization is said to have strong foundation in the understanding of Vedas and therefore is said to have survived thousands of years. Vastu Shastra is an ancient Hindu knowledge of architecture which finds its origin in Vedas. The Vedas gave principles and theories. Scholars suggest that planning of the villages, towns, cities and capitals of ancient India were considered best as it gave health and peacefulness based on the experience of many generations. The Vedas are the most ancient sacred scriptures of India. There are four Vedas, the Rig Veda which comprises of hymns and verses, Yajur Veda comprising of prayers um, and formula and so on, Sama Veda which comprises of melodies and chants. Atharva Veda we see which comprises of spells and enchantations for the practice of magic. These Vedas have four supplementary Vedas which we call Upavedas. Among the four Upavedas, Sthapatya Veda deals with architecture. Vastu Shastra, the ancient science of designing and constructing building is a part of Sthapatya Veda considered as an applied knowledge subordinate to the Atharva Veda which is the fourth Veda. It is interesting to see that in Vastu Shastra the plot for residences were allotted profession wise which indicates developed understanding of zoning like Brahmins the priests were located in the northern part of the city while the Kshatriyas the warrior class in the eastern part of the city and the Vaishyas the business class in the southern part of the city whereas Shudras the working class as described were located in the west part of the city. So we can see how there was land zoning done in the period however was based on the profession which also indicates the strong social structure which followed segregation at that time. In this period we see that there was good understanding of plot size and location. However, there were elements of division and non-inclusion of communities based on their professions. We see that we no longer witness this in our Indian cities. A lot of efforts were made and continued to be made by the social uh, leaders, planners and government for equality and inclusiveness in development. Looking at the fundamentals of Vedic architecture and planning, according to the scholar Reena Thakur, she expresses that Vastu Shastra is essentially an art of correct settings 
whereby one can optimize maximum benefits of Panchabhutas that are the five elements and of the nature also earth's magnetic field and the rotational influences of the sun, moon and the other planets surrounding the earth. So, we see that it brought understanding of the local environment as well as the understanding of a larger universe and its interaction with human beings based on those Vedas laid down several princi principles for constructing buildings such as houses, commercial complexes, industry layout, towns and temples. You may think of it as a building bylaws of that time. The guidelines provided the doctrine of orientation to take maximum benefits of sun rays, also provides guide lines and process for site planning. It emphasized strongly the examining of the soil, the size, the shape, the taste, the color, the smell and the vegetation of the land. If the plot of land was found to be satisfactory on these criteria, then it was selected for the purpose of building a house, village, industry, town, fort and so on. It also provided the measurements and proportions to be used in architecture and planning. We also see that it provides specific guidelines based on the site specifications on the six aspects of the building such as foundation, structure and so on. The period also shows strong understanding of aesthetics at the building level as well as planning level. So, we see considerable understanding was developed of various factors such as orientation, topography, build form and aesthetics in this period. We also see understanding of measurement and proportion in the built form called mana to attain harmony in the built environment. The Vedas indicate further division of measurement into six categories measurement of height, breadth, width or circumference, measurement along plumb lines, measurement of thickness and measurement of interspaces. So, you also see the elements of architecture and urban design being employed in the, in the townscape. Aligned with the building construction guidelines, we see extensive details including foundation which is the base, each having its associated terms like adhisthana column, pada or stamba, entablature, prastara, ear or wings, karna, roof, shikhara and dome, stupi. Further they developed formulas called ayadi to assess the qualities of the house called guna. These guidelines are termed as ayadi sadvarga, the six canons of Vedic architecture. So, we see that they had guidelines for construction as well as had framework to measure the health of the built environment. We see that aesthetics was one of the key element. It was attained through ornamentation, texture, flow, solemnity, symmetry, color, granularity, the interaction of sunlight and shadows, transcendence and harmony. Now, looking at the Vastu Purusha Mandala, Vastu Purusha Mandala is considered a model of the universe and provides the basis for architectural design. Here Vastu means environment, site or building and Purusha means men and Mandala means diagram of the universe. It had metaphorical expression of the plan of the universe and depicted the link between people, building and nature. As a concept, it extended to include village, town, country and whole earth in all its manifestations. The theory from Vedas suggested that when a building is in a perfect state or order, it is viewed as a Purusha, the man of the universe representing pure energy, soul or consciousness and a kind of creative intelligence in the universe. According to the theory, it is believed that Vastu Purusha is the form of human in a planned site, in a planned house, in a planned palace, in a planned village, in a planned city, which is characterized by the symbol of zodiac sign, constellation and planets. The Vastu Purusha Mandala theory was considered to be universal. 
that it could be applied to an altar, a temple, a house, a city or entire cosmos. It is worth noting that the relationship with the environment and the human being was much understood and respected in the period. The relationship was studied at the intermediate level and also at large scale level considering the properties of the universe as a whole. However, in this period human, in particular man was seen to be in the center and not the environment. This may indicate the challenge of perspective at that period of man centric approach and also we see gender squaredness in principles and approaches. The Vedas also gave the procedural understanding of town planning and all the factors which resulted in functional settlements such as consideration of location, orientation, climate, water, protection, resources and topography. Further we see that Vedas also provided different types of plans based on topography of the site. Vasu Shastra recommends plans of five shapes for the towns. Chandura which is square, Agatara which means rectangle, Vrata which means circle, Krata Vrata which is which means elliptical and Gola Vrata which means full circle. A city resembling Vajra, Sukai or a diamond octagonal shaped was suggested to be inauspicious. The Mansara Shilp Sastra which is Indian Vedic book, one of the ancient formal book on Hindu town planning provides various types of plans like Dandaka which is like a cross stick. Sarvoto Bhadra which represents equality, Nandya Varta which is a shape of a flower, Padmaka which is shape of the lotus flower, Swastika which is a religious symbol, Prastara which is like uh, which is a meeting place, Karmukha which indicates the bow shaped and Chaturmukha which indicates four gated complex. In the image here we see Dandaka type of plan, Sarvoto Bhadra and Nandya Varta. In the image here we see Padmaka type of plan, Swastika and Prastara. In the images here we see Karmukha type of plan and Chaturmukha. In the mentioned types of town plans the main streets called Raj Marga were oriented east west with idea that roads get purified by the sun rays. All the sub lanes were kept north south, one road was kept running around the town for the use of priest only, we can call it as a reserved path. This road was known as Mangal Vithi, which means auspicious path. Looking at Dandakas, uh, we see that uh, in this type of plan, streets are straight and cross each other at right angles at center. Villages had four gates on four sides, village would be rectangular or square shaped. Width of the street would vary from one to five dandas. Two transfer streets at the extremities would have single row of houses. The village office would be located in the east. The female deity Yama Devta located outside the village and the male deities in the northern portion. Looking at Sarvoto Bhadra type of plan, one of the example uh, which we see um, in our cities is Sadasi Vapat in Telangana uh, is planned as per Sarvoto Bhadra type plan. Further we see that Madurai temple earlier it was a town is based on Nandya Varta town plan. The streets run parallel to the central adjoining streets with the temple of the presiding deity in the center of the town. This plan is commonly used for construction of towns and not for villages. It is generally adopted for the sites either circular or square in shape ranging uh, covering 3000 to 4000 houses. Likewise we see Padmaka. This type of plan was practiced for building of towns with fortress all around. The pattern of the plan resembled the petals of lotus radiating outwards from the center. 
The city used to be practically an island surrounded by water having no scope for expansion. Likewise, we see swastika type of plan which contemplates some diagonal streets dividing the site into certain rectangular plots. The site need not be marked out into a square or rectangle and it may be of any shape. A rampart wall surrounds the town with a moat at its foot filled with water. Two main streets cross each other at the center running south to north and west to east. The characteristic feature of this plan is that the site may be either square or rectangular but not triangular or circular. The sites are set apart from the poor, the middle class, the rich and the very rich. The sizes of sites increasing according to the capacity of each to purchase or built upon. There were much distinct main roads in the plan which was one of the key attributes of this type of plan compared to other patterns. The town may or may not be surrounded by a fort. So we see that the fort would not be an essential requirement for such cities. We see that old Jaipur in Rajasthan was founded in November 1727 by King Savaijay Singh who ruled from 1700 to 1743 and this particular plan was based on Prastara plan. The architect who conceived the plan of the town was Vidyadhar Bhattacharya. Many scholars have attributed the basic concept plan of old Jaipur as being a Prastara type of mandala mentioned in Mansara. Next we see Karmukha plan which is said to be suitable for the place where the site of the town was in form of a bow or a semicircular or parabolic. This plan was mostly applied for towns located on the seashore or river banks. We can see that old Banaras situated at the bank of river Ganga is based on this plan. The main streets of the town run from north to south or east to west and cross streets run at right angle to them dividing the whole area into blocks. The presiding deity, commonly a female deity is installed in the temple built in any convenient place. We find Ganj Golai, Latur in Maharashtra an old Banaras city layout built on the principles of Karmokha. Further seeing the uh, Chaturmukha type of plan as we see in the plan of Angkor Wat, the city may be either square or rectangular having four faces. The town is laid out east to west lengthwise with four main streets. The temple of the presiding deity will be always at the center. Chaturmukha type of plan is applicable to all towns starting from the largest town to the smallest villages. It is interesting to see Angkor Wat in Cambodia built in 12th century was developed on this concept of Chaturmukha. We also see that even plot size variations were worked out as per the zones, location, social economic structure of the society. Moving on, on the Vedic period, we see that even plot size variations were worked out as per the zones, locations, the social economic structure of the society. The whole Vastu Purusha Mandala was divided into 816449 pads or landed parcels. Innermost and the central location of the square was reserved for God Brahma. So we see that as this period religion was at the center stage of the planning and community life. So we see how the special planning and physical planning understanding prevailed in this period. We also see the information on land suitability for the purpose of site selection for the development of settlement. The Vedas provide site classification as per Rao's study in 1995, barren land called Jangala with qualitative assessment like hot wind and black soil was mentioned. Further we see another uh, typology which was Anupama suggested as beautiful land and we also see 
sadharna considered as average quality of land. We also see great knowledge noted by the writings of Sukracharya on geographical locations of capital city. The Mansara describes soil testing procedure and information on topography. Further we see in this period town planning uh, process was also evolved. It gave lot of inputs on the shape of the town like we have already seen earlier. We also see details of site planning process coming up in this period. We see descriptions such as what steps should be followed to determine the direction, shape, size and ground coverage. Most important example of town planning according to Vastu principle was first depicted in Arthashastra in the medieval period known as Patliputra and Takshila which is in present day in Pakistan. Another well known example is the city of Jaipur. Modern architects have applied Vastu Purusha Mandala in some towns and cities such as Jaipur. Chandigarh has been also studied to resemble the pattern by many scholars. Another very interesting fact is to see the Chanakya's Arthashastra. Arthashastra which is an ancient Indian Sanskrit discourse on government, economic policy and military strategy which was given by Chanakya. Chanakya was a philosopher, economist and statesman who wrote the Indian political treatise, the Arthasastra which means economics. In this seminal work, he had compiled almost every aspect of what had been written in India up to that time regarding property, economics or material success. Arthashastra provided discourses on how the population should be handled like it gave input on the congested town where it highlighted that how the surplus population should be relocated in the new place and how the town should be positioned to help each other. We also see that in the current times that we plan counter magnets to diverge the population and to work in sync with each other. We see that these were discourses which addressed the current regional planning issues. We see that the Arthashastra also addressed the financing part. It talked about Sangrahan, collection register and tax collector. Arthashastra talks about governance as well. We find word like Sarvatik which was like appointed person among 200 villages, Dronamuk chief among 400 uh, villages and Sthaniye among 800 villages as you can see in the diagram. It is very interesting to see the Arthashastra also address the issue of migrants. It acknowledges how they have to be supported by complete relaxation from paying taxes in the new settlement. It is interesting to note that there are descriptions of new villages in the land of ancient India which talks about how the demographic profiles are. We see it describes like higher proportion of agriculturists and shudras in the villages. The description also indicates the existence of the marketplace for the sale of goods received from traders on, on the highway. We also find use of terms dams which were constructed over rivers and nalas. So we can see existence of these construction techniques in the period and usage of this for the agriculture purpose. We also see that temples and gardens were specified to be provided. Arrangements for the aged, the children and informal persons were also addressed indicating the presence of guidelines for development and provisions of open spaces and accommodating differently abled persons the way we follow guidelines today. It also addressed the focus area for economy, setting vision and perspective for the place. Like we see it talks about how cereals and wells will grow if agriculturists are kept busy and attempts should be made to protect and increase quarries, forests and canals. Arthashastra also provides input on town planning. It specifies as how the city should be located. It suggests the central location to facilitate trade and commerce. 
Further, it provides input on site like the area should be large and should be near the perennial water body and also the desertation displays the understanding of the topography and related shape which should be adopted like it mentions that circular, rectangular or square should be adopted as per the topography. The document also indicates the need for spatial segregation of uses such as separate areas for marketing different goods and as per the protections concerns at that time, the document also provided guidelines for high wall around the town like it also gave the measurements like 6 dandas high and 12 dandas wide and provision of layered moat system like 3 moats of 14, 12, 10 feet wide to be constructed 4 arm lengths apart with the depth three-fourths of the width. The document also provided the guidelines for road layout to favor uniform accessibility with concern for health and ventilation like it provided input on three east, west and three north, south roads should divide the towns and the main road should be eight dandas wide and other roads four dandas wide. Further input was also given on provision of common infrastructure to provide access to water such as one well for 10 houses. As we can see in the image, the outer layered moat and the street pattern advised during the period. Further we see that the principles of town planning are mentioned in some sacred books like Vishma, Karma, Prakashan. It is mentioned first lay out towns and then plan the houses. Mansara Shilpa Sastra deals with many aspects of town planning. The importance of studies like study of soil, climatic condition, topography, fixing orientation to get maximum advantage of sun and wind. So we see that how in this period a strong understanding of man and his relationship with environment was established. The relationship was studied at the intermediate level and also at a large scale level with interpretation of properties of universe as a whole. We also see form of building bylaws corresponding with the environment and plot size, soil type and topography. We also see that Vedic period saw the emergence of hierarchy of social classes, early Vedic age was organized into tribes rather than kingdoms, political hierarchy of tribe was determined by rank where Rajan stood at the top and Dasi at the bottom. The autonomy of Rajan was restricted by the tribal councils called Sabha and Samiti. In the later Vedic period, the tribes had consolidated into small kingdoms which had a capital and rudimentary administrative systems. Later Vedic age led to this distancing of the Rajan from the people and the emergence of Varna hierarchy. The society was divided into four social groups, Brahmin, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas and Shutras. We further see economy in the Vedic period was sustained by combination of pastoralism and agriculture. There are references in Rig Veda uh, to the leveling of fields, seed processing and storage of grains in large jars, w war bounty was also a major source of wealth. Economic exchange were conducted by gift giving particularly to kings and priests and barter using cattle as a unit of currency while gold is mentioned in some hymns there is no indication of the use of coins. We further see education system in the Vedic period the ancient system of education was based on Vedas and therefore it was given the name of Vedic educational system. The Vedic era education had a very prominent place in society. It was being considered as pious and important for this society. Education emphasized the development of spirituality. The ashram system was adopted for paying of the individual's debt towards the God, his forefather, his teachers and society. Ultimate objective as moksha or self-realization we see in the system. Vedic education included proper pronunciation and recitation of Veda, the rules of sacrifice, 
grammar, understanding the secrets of nature, reasoning including logic, the science and the skills necessary for an occupation. So, in this session we have covered uh, the Vedic period and we saw how much understanding we had about cities uh, in this particular time and how the processes and details like guidelines and uh, kind of building laws all came up in this period that understanding evolved during this period. Our coverage was limited with the scope to make you aware of the topic. There are enormous readings and movies available to explore. Few are suggested here. This is not an extensive list. You may feel free to suggest more from your experience. Please feel free to ask questions. Let us know about your concerns you have. Do share your opinion, experiences and suggestions. Looking forward to interacting and co-learning with you while exploring cities and urban planning. That is all for this session, uh, we will continue in the another session, the uh, Greek and Roman part of civilization. Thank you.